Good morning, friends. I'm glad that you could join us for church today. Uh, such as it is in our electronic format, I'm glad you could be here as we celebrate the baptism of the Lord today. Friends, just a few things, a few announcements uh, the, to get out of the way. Hopefully next week on the 17th of January, we'll be back in back in the sanctuary of Periopolis. Uh, we'll well, that's the plan as of right now. If something changes, of course, we'll let everyone know. Uh, but as of next week, we plan to be back in person for service. Uh, what a blessing uh, with some enhanced cleaning measures and some um, enhanced UV light things that go on the furnace. I'm not sure of all the technology with that, but, um, but things to help keep you safe. Um, of course, masks will still be required like they were before, um, and we will gather together next week. And we will worship in person, and it will be glorious. What a glorious day it will be indeed. So friends, let's, let's prepare our hearts for our worship today with our prelude. As this is playing, please just kind of reflect upon uh, this week. It's been a rough week in our nation. Uh, we've dealt with a lot. You know, in our lives, we deal with a lot each and every day. We suffer and we struggle. But friends, this is our time of worship. This is our time to put all of that aside and to gather at the feet of Jesus and worship him for being our Lord and our King. Friends, please prepare for worship with me. Friends, please join with me in the call to worship. Today, we celebrate a special baptism 
the baptism of Jesus of Nazareth, God says, Look, see my chosen servant, the one in whom I utterly delight. I have placed my spirit on him. He will bring true justice to the nations. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened up, and spirit came down like a dove, and there was a voice from heaven saying, This is my dearly loved Son, with whom I am delighted. The joy of the Lord be with you all, and also with you. Friends, if you please join with me in our hymn of praise today, Shall We Gather at the River? Sorry, friends, I got so lost in the words that I forgot to change to the last slide. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, but if you'll join with me in our opening prayer today. Please pray with me. Most wonderful God, foolish and flawed though we are, we too delight in your beloved Son. As in his name, we gather in the house of many praises. May the heavens be opened for us that we may catch a glimpse of that light and love that transforms our common days with a beauty not of our making, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, I miss our time of sharing. I can't wait to get back with all of you and hear all of the great stories from these past few weeks that we haven't been together, things that we're thankful for, things that we need prayer for. Uh, 
I can't wait <laughs> to be able to do that. Uh, the list will be a mile long, and I love it. But friends, wherever we're at, we can pray together. We can pray for each other, as we always should. And we can celebrate the joys in our lives and the things that God has done for us. Please join with me in prayer. I'll give some prompts and some pauses for you to reflect upon those things for your joys and concerns at the appropriate time. Wherever you're at, you can just shout them out like you would in church. You know, it's not important that I hear you. It's important that God hears you, but he already knows what's in your hearts and in your minds. Let's pray. Dear Lord, first and foremost, we thank you for technology. We thank you for that, which is sometimes, <coughs> sometimes a gift, excuse me, and sometimes a curse. But Lord, in this situation, it is most certainly a gift that we can gather together, even in the midst of the absence of one another. We know that we're gathered together in the presence of you. Lord, where two or more are gathered, your promise that you'll be there, even whenever we're gathered, not technically in the same place. But Lord, we know that you're with us. Lord, we're thankful for all of the blessings that you have bestowed upon us over this past week and over the past few weeks, whenever we have been uh, not in person. Lord, we thank you for those things now. Lord, there are many that are suffering, many that have heartaches, many that have things that they need for you to resolve. Lord, we know that you can do that. We have to ask if it's in your will, Lord, for healings and you can do miraculous things. Lord, today, all those that are sick, that are afflicted with some kind of disease, or um, whether it's COVID or whether it's cancer, Lord, or any, any of those other things, pneumonia, Lord, we lift those people to you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for those, for those people, Lord, that need you. Lord, for those people that don't yet know how you're working in their lives. Those people that have not recognized your holy presence, your divine direction, your merciless love. Lord, we lift those people to you now. Lord, so much can be learned from the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The church, as we prepare for the sermon, for the scripture lesson today, which I hope you'll enjoy. It's a little different than what we normally do. Um, but... As we prepare for that, let's let's prepare our hearts with singing. Um, as we ask that God opens up our eyes to what he wants to be heard this morning. Be thou my vision.
Park friends. I don't know what happened to our last uh, set of words there, but that's okay to just sit and reflect. So here we go. Here we go. Starting our new worship series this week. Uh, it's called Follow Me. And today, our message is tearing apart the heavens. So I'm going to see if I can bring my picture back up here in the corner. Uh, hopefully you can see that now. So, friends, our, our, our scripture today is from the book of Mark. Okay, from the book of Mark. And we're actually looking at the beginning of Mark. Mark 1, 4 through 11. Okay, Mark 1, 4 through 11. And hear the word of the Lord. John, the baptizer, appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, if you have ever brought kids to church, or you raised your kiddos in the church, you've probably heard them say the phrase, why do we do that in church? Well, baptism is another one of those things that a lot of the time we know is something that we have to do according to tradition, but do we really know why we do it? Or why we believe the way we do about baptism. Today as we celebrate the baptism of Jesus and the great story that you just heard, I wanted to take a more historical approach to help us understand why we do that. The baptism of Jesus is one of the truly remarkable stories in the Bible. You know, if we if we look in the, in the three other Gospels besides Mark, we get similar accounts of the scene of when Jesus is baptized. Okay, they have more detail than what Mark does. Um, we get more description of the scene in the other Gospels with more specifics. Uh, but they all kind of have that common theme like Mark does. I won't bore you with all the details, um, but, but it seems that Mark was a source for the other gospel writers, and they were writing for different audiences. So Mark is kind of more of a basic text than the other gospels. Hey, the beauty in that is that in a lot of cases, Mark gives us these quick scenes that allow us to, you know, to to take a very quick look at what at what is happening, and be able to analyze it pretty easy. The baptism of Jesus story. Is, is the same way. Mark gives us this quick little snippet in there about Jesus being baptized, with three verses long, right? I gotta go back up and look and say, yeah, three verses long, right? Nine through 11 talks about Jesus. As a matter of fact, John the Baptist, right, gets five verses of introduction, and the baptism of Jesus in the book of Mark gets three verses. You know, in, in the UM Church, United Methodist Church, we have two sacraments, okay, Holy Eucharist or Communion and Baptism. 
You know, if, if we look at our brothers and sisters that are, that are Catholic, they have seven different sacraments. Okay, we have two. We have baptism and we have communion. Right? Each of them are of equal importance in the life of a believer of Christ and one who has professed their faith through the United Methodist tradition. So let's really dig in and kind of start unpacking some of this and talk about the historicity of baptism and why we do what we do today and where we came from. All right, Mark doesn't give us any backstory on John the Baptist as the other gospel writers do. Right? He jumps right into to what John is doing, right? only with a kind of brief description of, of who John is. I apologize for the illustration picture, but you know, I couldn't find a good picture of somebody that was dressed up like John. Um, but, you know, we just get this quick description of John as appearing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance of sin. In, in that he was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. Now, I don't know about the locust part. Wild honey sounds good, though. But locusts, of course, though, to get wild honey, of course, we probably would have to battle some bees. So that doesn't sound like fun either. Um, so really, a true wilderness adventurer, right? Out in Out in the wilderness, just searching and living off the land. Okay. This introduction is very important um, to the book of Mark. It really kind of sets up the stage for the rest of Mark, which we're going to continue to look at um, a lot of Mark through the beginning of Lent. Okay. Uh, the lectionary gives us a lot of Mark between now and then. Um, but the lectionary skips over this week the very first verses in the book of Mark, verses 1 through 3, which I think are extremely important to understanding this section, to understanding this 4 through 11 section. So I'm going to go back and, and I'm going to share those with you now. So here from, from Mark 1, 1 through 3. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that's how Mark opens his gospel. Isn't that amazing? The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Right there is all we need to know about Jesus. Okay. Then it continues on, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. Okay, so Mark is giving us some reference back to Isaiah. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Okay, so if, if we're talking about John the Baptist in the book of Mark, we have to look at these verses. Right? Mark is giving us the reason that John the Baptist is significant in, in the book of Mark and in, in, in how he must be this must be included, right? He must be part of this Jesus narrative that Mark is giving us. The, the prophet Isaiah said that there had to be a messenger that was sent ahead of the Messiah right? or Jesus, right? And also that he will call or that he will come out of the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. As we see, that's who John the Baptist was. He was a wilderness wanderer. We, we see in Mark's description that John the Baptist, he, he really is that. Right? He appeared in the wilderness where he ate locusts, he ate wild honey, and he had and he had people confessing their sins, preparing for the message that was going to be brought by Jesus. It's important to the to the readers of Mark for that link to the Old Testament. And it is just as important for us today to kind of bridge that gap between the old and the new. Right? So many times we look at the Old Testament and we think, oh, what does this have to do with anything? This isn't what Jesus taught. But if we go back and look, the whole Old Testament is just building up to Jesus. It's calling out 
the salvation through Christ. And this is just another one of those examples where the prophet Isaiah gives us these words, these prophetic words of who will prepare for Jesus and how Jesus, the Messiah, right, who the Jewish people longed for, would be there and ready, preaching and preparing the way for that message. I, to truly understand the sacrament of baptism, uh, we need to look at the Old Testament uh, in the practices of washing with water in order to, to cleanse items that seem to be defiled. And if that sounds like our understanding of baptism, hey, it really is. And that has really defined what we believe today as United Methodists as baptism. Okay, so I, I'm going to kind of walk you through history here. That's why I said earlier in the video that this is going to be a little bit different of a sermon. Okay. I'm going to give you a good old history lesson today. Okay. You know that my past life I was a teacher. Um, I'm kind of reverting back to that here, but I think we need teaching moments as well as deep preaching moments. But the preaching will come, trust me. Understanding the word from a historical context will always give us a better understanding of who Christ is in our lives. So let's look at some of the Old Testament um, uses of baptism. A baptism of purification. It, in the Old Testament, uh, washings were almost always for those of the already believing community. They symbolize cleansing from sin and guilt. And whereas sacrifices were to atone for acts of sin, washing or bathing seems to generally be associated with a cleansing from a sinful or otherwise ungodly condition. Okay, there were really kind of three kinds, um, or, or at least I'm going to give you three examples uh, from Old Testament of this baptism of purification. It, so it, it was in a national sense, as in a sense of, you know, corporately as a church being purified through the cleansing. And we can find that in Exodus 19, 10 through 11. Before God spoke to the Israelites from Sinai, he commanded them to consecrate themselves, wash their clothes, and be ready by the third day when he would appear to them. Okay, so he's calling out to the whole congregation, look, you be ready, get clean, right? Because third day we roll. That's where he's at. Third day we roll. Be clean. Be ready to go. Okay, then we can see it from a priestly perspective. If we look at the book of Leviticus, Leviticus 8, 6 through 9. At the consecration of the priests, Moses brought Aaron and his sons forward and washed them with water. Okay, so washed with water as being received into the priesthood. That was a baptism of purification. And then the individual practice, right, this baptism of purification. We find that example in Leviticus 14, 8 through 9. A person who had recovered from an unclean skin disease had to wash his clothes, shave off all his hair, and bathe with water to be ceremonial, ceremonially clean. Okay, so for, in order for them to go back into society, to be a part of society once again, they had to bathe themselves. They had to go through this ritual of cleansing with water, right? And, and, and this seems kind of odd to us whenever we talk about like bathing as being baptism, right? But you got to think they didn't, you know, bathe like some of us that, that shower once, sometimes twice a day, right? Yeah, they they didn't they weren't like that. Um, they didn't have that opportunity. They didn't. Um, that wasn't of a high priority for them. Okay, that 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 came out of later thoughts of in culture of vanity, and that's a another lesson for another day. Um, but right, they, so they didn't bathe on a regular basis. Okay, it was done more as a as a ceremony, as an act of baptism, of that cleansing with water. Okay. We can move a little bit 
you know, more forward in history um, as we look at the New Testament forms of baptism. But before we look at those New Testament uh, baptism, I, I kind of want to touch on this this weird period of the intertestamental and, and, and rabbinic Judaism um, views of baptism. I don't have a slide for it, um, but just bear with me here. Um, so this is kind of in between, right, the Old Testament writings and what we see in the time of Jesus. Okay, um, so baptism of, of purification, okay, still a baptism of purification. So the Jewish community at Qumran, okay, which is, um, if you're into history, right, it was probably in a scene group um, from about the second century BC through the first century AD. Um, they're the ones that are famous uh, for the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're attributed to, to the Essenes. Um, but they used washing as a rite of cleansing. Okay, from um, in, in this, we get this idea from the Damascus rule, which uh, was was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Oh, so, um, ac according to Qumran, which, which isn't scripture, okay. So, um, but these were just um, scholarly writings, we could say, um, or, or documents of the group. Um, the, the Essenes were really good at keeping tabs and like writing everything down that happened. Um, so this is from, from the Qumran. Um, and this is from chapter 10. It says, No man shall bathe in dirty water or in an amount too shallow to cover a man. He shall not purify himself with water contained in a vessel. And then from chapter 11, No man entering the house of worship shall come unclean and in need of washing. Okay, so rules of life, right? Rules of life. Make sure you take a bath before you come to church. Okay, so that purification, um, we're starting starting to see that purification. Okay, and then in early rabbinic history, um, we had a baptism of intention, a okay? baptism of intention. And when Rebianic and earlier forms of Judaism, baptism, um, alongside male circumcision and sacrificial offerings was a requirement for full conversion. Um, the, the, the dating of this practice is somewhat kind of obscure, but it postdates the Old Testament and predates uh, the Mishnah, right? The, 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 the newer writings. The, the Sankyo Talmud states, as your forefathers entered into the covenant only by circumcision, immersion and the sprinkling of the blood so shall they uh, enter the covenant only by circumcision immersion and the sprinkling of blood okay so baptism uh, of intention and then later we see baptism of purification in later rabbinic history right after the destruction of the temple in 70 a.d the biblical purification laws they were confined to the purification of the nida, or the, the ritually unclean women, um, discussed in certain passages like Leviticus 12, 1 through 8, and, and 15, 19 through 24. Um, the, the, the Jewish okay, immersion or ritual bath embraces both of the categories of purification and initiation and is practiced among Orthodox Jews even to this day. Hey, now we can get to our, our New Testament, our New Testament baptism of repentance. Hey, John the Baptist used baptism to symbolize an individual's repentance or their turn to the covenant, return to the covenant. Covenant. He demanded that an inward conversion precede the outward sign and be followed by evidence of a changed, of a changed life. So John, this is from Mark 1, 4, we just heard. Um, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So in this early New Testament time period, um, others also practiced a baptism of repentance. Okay, so a writing from the Sibylline Oracles dated about 80 AD 
um, AD or CE contains this passage. So, so hear this. Ah, wretched mortals, change these things and do not lead the great God to all sorts of anger, but abandon daggers and groanings, murders and outrages, and wash your whole bodies in perennial rivers. Stretch out your hands to heaven and ask forgiveness for your previous deeds. John's baptism differed distinctly because of his specific reference to the one yet to come, who would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And that's from, from Matthew 3, 11. So this Christian rite of baptism, right? Baptism in the Christian rite of baptism can be a baptism of identification. Christian baptism is rich in symbolism and significance. It is symbolic of entering into Jesus' death and his resurrection. Okay, this is a reading from Romans 6, 3 through 5. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised up from the dead, we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. See, it, it, it's really a symbolic passing through judgment into salvation. Okay, and this is from 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, by whom also he went and preached unto the spirits in person, who at one time were disobedient. In the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing, in which few were saved by water, the like figure unto which even baptism doth also now save us, and not the pulling away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven. Hey, besides this baptism of identification, we also uh, um, you know, through the, the, the Christian rite, we have the spirit baptism of believers, okay? the baptism of application, baptism of application. So, so hear this. This is from the book of Acts, Acts eleven sixteen. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The work of Jesus is applied not symbolically, but in reality by the Holy Spirit to the believer. Now that's a promise. That's a promise through your baptism. Some aspects of the of the Spirit's work include this from 1 Corinthians 12, 13, an initiation into a new life. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Greeks, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. Hey, it, it, the, the, the spirit cleanses right? this, through cleansing. And this is from Titus 3, 5 through 6. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So, friends, I, I know that was kind of a lot of terms and, and time periods and um, a lot of different kind of thoughts and things to throw at you, but hopefully... It gives you a picture of what baptism was, right, and what baptism is today through the word. 
The, our scripture today says that Jesus was then baptized by John. And he saw the heavens are torn apart. Right? The heavens were torn apart. And the spirit descended like a dove. Then a voice from heaven said, You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. Friends, it is, if we were in person, we would do our baptism remembrance service. But with baptism being a sacrament in the church, um, our, our, our bishop has um, made it clear that we're not to do, um, not to do communion electronically. So I'm assuming the same would, pl- would apply for baptism. Um, but hopefully once we get back in person, maybe we'll have time to come back and revisit this. I, I hope so, um, because it's such a beautiful service to remember our baptism. Um, but, but I, I kind of want to give you the final rundown here. What we as United Methodists believe about baptism. Okay. So you can follow along on your screen. Your baptism is at the heart of the gospel of grace and at the core of the church's mission. When we baptize, we say that we understand as Christians about ourselves and our community, that we are loved into being by God, lost because of sin, but redeemed and saved in Jesus Christ to live new lives in anticipation of his coming again in glory. Baptism is an expression of God's love for the world. And the effects of baptism also express God's grace. As baptized people of God, we therefore respond with praise and thanksgiving, praying that God's will will be done in our own lives. From the song, Wash, O God, Our Sons and Daughters. We, your people, stand before you, water washed and spirit born. By your grace, our lives we offer. Recreate us, God, transform. Let us pray. Oh, dear Lord, we are so thankful for our baptisms. Lord, we are so thankful that through you we have been baptized just as Jesus has been baptized. Lord, not only is a remembrance of what Jesus did, but Lord, that touching of the Holy Spirit upon our lives, right? the spirit that's given at baptism, Lord, we're so thankful, so thankful for your spirit that guides us each and every day. Lord, through our baptism, the outward, symbol of our of our committing our lives to you lord we have done just that we've given our lives to you and as we remember our baptism today just let us reflect on how you have moved in our lives since our baptism whether we remember it or not whether we were infants or or um, or were baptized as teenagers or young adults or Older adults, Lord, let us take time to reflect upon the things that you have done in our lives since we made that outward expression, Lord, that we surrender to you, that we are moved by you, that we are living for you. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for you. In the name of your most holy son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, one more week. One more week and we'll be back. Back in our church, back in our sanctuary. Ready to worship in person. I know I sure as heck want to have those lights turned on. And I want to have the heat on because it's going to be cold because it's the middle of winter. Um. We want to have the technology up and running, right? But we need your support. We need you to continue to support the ministry. 
support your church. And we thank you for all those that have given as we've been shut down. Truly a blessing. Truly a, bless, a blessing. We thank you for that. And, you know, it's always, it's hard to sit here and say, you know, give money, give money, give money, because that's not what it's about. It's about that commitment that you've made with the Lord, right? To, to honor him, to please him, um, to show, to show your devotion to him through this ministry, through this church. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you'll pray with me over, over the offering that, that we are, um, that we're sending in. God of redemption and new life. We focus once more this day on the greatest gift ever given. Jesus, our savior. As he was baptized by John in the Jordan, we were able to share in his baptism and receive the promise of sharing in Jesus' resurrection. As we leave a painful year behind and look with new hope to a new year ahead, help us to live and give of ourselves, of those who know every day what a great gift we have been given. May it move us to give our whole selves more freely. In the name of Christ, our Savior and Redeemer, we pray. Amen. Now, if you'll join in our hymn of commitment, this is going to be a little different. Be a little different. Told you we were outside the box today. Um, unfortunately, you get to see me in a little box, but uh, we're outside the box today. Uh, wade in the water. Uh, if you don't know this song, um, it, it's, a, it's a traditional um, slave song. They would sing this in the fields as they were working. Um, and if you dig deep into into some of the words and some of the some of the verses, um, it was used as a key identifier in the Underground Railroad um, you know, to say that you know, whenever it was time to go, right? They were speaking in code. Um, there's a lot of great programs you can watch about that. But more importantly, right, wading in the water of baptism, our baptism that we um, that we where we have given ourselves to the Lord. And so follow along. Um, I'm not going to try to sing. Um, these recordings are all in a high key. I can't, I can't hit them. I've tried. Um, but follow along with the words and just kind of soak in, soak in those words um, of, of this traditional, of this traditional um, American slave song, um, and also a hymn. Right? It's in our United Methodist hymn books. So um, here we go.
as you will join me. Hear the words, receive the benediction. Go now and live in the spirit of your baptism. Even when you are led into wild and hard places, with repentance and trust, give yourselves to God. And with fasting and prayer, strengthen yourselves against the ways of the tempter. And may God enfold you in the tender and lasting love. May Christ be beside you in times of struggle. And may the Spirit guide you back to the path wherever you stray. That you may keep the covenant. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Friends, go now in peace.